Good evening. I would like to call the April 14, 2022 meeting of the Greenville City Council to order. I'm Mayor P.J. Connolly and I'll be moderating tonight's meeting. First, I'd like to call on Councilmember Smiley for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll have a moment of silence. Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Mayor Connolly? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Glover? Here. Councilmember Daniels? Present. Councilmember Bell? Here. Councilmember Smiley? Here. Councilmember Litchfield? Present. Councilmember Meyerhofer? I am here. All right, Mayor Connolly of Accord. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the approval of tonight's agenda. Madam Manager, any recommended changes? Um, Mayor, we would like to add a closed session. I believe this, the attorney will have a motion for, for that closed session towards the end of the meeting. Correct, Mr. McGurk. That's correct, Madam Manager. I have a closed session motion, which I can read toward the end of the meeting. Sounds good. Anyone would like to make a motion to approve the agenda? Move to approve. As revised? As revised. As revised. Second. All right. Motion's been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Meyerhofer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to our special recognitions. Okay, if you'll tray, there we go, because I can't handle everything. Okay, you have to stand in the middle. Yeah. The honoree has to be in the middle. Nice. You doing okay today? Yes, ma'am. Well, doing good. wonderful. Well, I bet. Um, it is always, as city manager, ooh, as city manager, it's always a real privilege for me to be able to recognize um, our city staff, particularly on the occasion of their retirement. And it's that, I have that honor this evening to recognize Chris May, Lieutenant Chris May. And I'll read you a little bit about Chris May, and then we'll let Chief Sanders speak, uh, um, say a few words as well. So Lieutenant Chris May began his career with the Granville Fire Department on January the 19th of 1993. He was hired as one of 12 fire rescue trainees that began their service on the city to the city on that day. And that group remains one of the largest academies to be hired by the department. Throughout his career, Lieutenant May has been instrumental in leading numerous departmental initiatives to include being one of the founding members of the department's urban search and rescue team, the North Carolina Task Force Number 10. In addition, Lieutenant May was among the first on the team to obtain his Swift Water Rescue Technician Certification, of which, Lieutenant, uh, uh, of which lead Lieutenant May, led Lieutenant May to be sent throughout the state on numerous deployments in areas inundated by flood water. He also served as one of the principal departmental in instructors for the Safe Kids Car Seat Program, which included preparing all of our fire rescue cadets by teaching this curriculum as part of their initial training academy. While he served time throughout the department, Lieutenant May has served the majority of his career on shift three, where he was able to complete his time leading up to his retirement on April the 1st of 22. At the time, Lieutenant May has achieved over 29 years of loyal and outstanding service to our community, to Greenville. So please join me in congratulating Lieutenant May on his retirement. Hard to top that. Um, I, I just want to say it was such a pleasure, and I'm so glad that I got to come to work for the city of Greenville while you were still on shift. Um, I think the personnel out here, it's a testament to your leadership. I think from the very beginning, you were one of the first shifts that invited me to come to dinner and talk and visit with your, with your personnel, um, which I took very personally and humbly that you would do that, um, especially with you know, how many years of service that you had. So um, I think for everyone out there, the important thing is that you are a, um, an icon of what the fire service stands for. 
the amount of service that you gave, the extra mile that you went in order to accomplish all the things that you accomplished throughout your career, that's something that will forever be part of your history. And uh, you know, I, just, I couldn't be prouder uh, to be here for your retirement. Now our final, our final job is to give you the city plaque that recognizes your years of service at the city. And again, to congratulate you and thank you for your time. Once again, please join me. Okay, and we have one additional recognition. We'd like to call up Major Bowen as well as Captain Casey Thomas. Hello, hello. Yes, yes. Again, um, a real privilege for me to recognize the great work of our city staff, and this is an, uh, an opportunity tonight to recognize KZ Thomas, Captain KZ Thomas. KZ just completed, Captain Thomas just com completed the FBI National Academy. This is a 10-week program. It's comprised of the top 1% of law enforcement leaders around the world. The curriculum is challenging, and participants are exposed to regular physical fitness, along with leadership enrichment by some of the best trainers in our profession. The Greenville Fire Department had made the National Academy a focus for many years. Current members of the command staff continue to maintain their focus in serving in the North Carolina chapter of the FBI National Academy Associates as active board meetings. That will include Deputy Chief Sauls, Major Ivy, Major David Bowen, Captain Rich Tendall, and Chief Holzman, who have all completed this program. We are exceptionally proud of KZ. Um, KZ is Captain Thomas is the first female from GPD to attend the Academy. I'm going to say that one more time, okay? <laughs> Captain Thomas is the first female from our department to have attended the Academy. She was selected after an extensive background investigation vetted by the North Carolina chapter and endorsed by the Charlotte Field Office of the FBI. Um, again, we are so proud of Captain Thomas. We are so proud of her commitment to this department. And please join me in congratulating KZ for this accomplishment. On behalf of Chief Mark Holtzman and the Greenville Police Department, I also want to say as the most other recent graduate of the NA, we now have six NA graduates at the Greenville Police Department, and there are as very few departments in the state that can boast that. So only probably some of the bigger ones like uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg and the State Highway Patrol. So for us to have that many graduates currently active members is a great testament to our agency and also to Captain Thomas. So thank you for the opportunity, City Manager and Mayor, for allowing us to continue that partnership. Great. Now, I do. The last thing we get to do is put the Bestow the, the certificate. So congratulations. Thank you. We'll now move on to the public comment period. The public comment period is a period reserved for comments by the public. Items that were or are scheduled to be the subject of a public hearing conducted at this meeting or another meeting during the same week shall not be discussed. A total of 30 minutes is allocated with each individual being allowed no more than three minutes. Individuals who have registered with the city clerk to speak will speak in the order registered until the allotted 30 minutes expires. If time remains after all persons who have registered have spoken, individuals who did not register will have an opportunity to speak until the allotted 30 minutes expires. Madam Clerk, our first speaker. First speaker is Ms. Inez Dudley. Ms. Dudley, you have three minutes if you want to approach right there. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Good evening. My name is Inez Dudley. Um, April the 1st, April Fools, but it wasn't really an April Fools that day. I went downtown to do some banking at the Truist Bank, and there was an event taking place at one of the parking lots downtown. 
uh, right across the street from the Shepherd uh, uh, Library, right in front of the Jarvis Church. The music that I heard blasting all over the city was so vulgar. The MF and all kinds of uh, language that no citizen of uh, Greenville should even be exposed to. As I was doing my banking, I asked one of the bankers, I said, my God, have you guys had to put up with this all day? And they said, yes, all day long. It was very offensive. There were a lot of children downtown that day. And I just was so grieved. Uh, being a Christian, first and foremost, and giving glory to God, I think it was offensive to the Lord. And I think as a, a citizen anywhere in America, we should always be concerned about our citizens, uh, especially when you've got events with that kind of music. It was rap music with vulgarity, the kind of talk you don't want your children hearing. You don't want it in homes. You don't want to hear it anywhere. And I came today, I really kind of forgot about it, but it was God that put that on my mind to come here tonight so that I could express as a citizen of Greenville that we should not allow that anymore ever again. And with our business people downtown, they had to uh, listen to that all day long. I didn't like it. So that's why I'm here today, just to let you guys know that there are people who don't like hearing that music blasting all over the city, especially downtown, where our businesses are, where there are people visiting Greenville to enjoy themselves uh, because they like the city, mm -hmm. and then they have to come and hear stuff like that. So in behalf of the citizens of Greenville and in behalf of the kingdom of God, I wanted you guys to know how I felt. I think there are other people that feel that way. I want to leave you with the scripture. It's in <coughs> excuse me, Proverbs chapter 14. Verse 34, and it says this, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dudley. Appreciate the, uh, the feedback. Madam Clerk, our next speaker. Mayor Conley, we do not have any additional registered speakers. Anyone else would like to speak during the public comment period? Please come forward, state your name for the record. You have three minutes. <laughs> the city manager has strict policy against that. <laughs> All right, seeing none, we'll close the public comment period. We'll move on to appointments. Madam Clerk. First board is the Affordable Housing Loan Committee. Mayor for Tim Glover. Board of Housing Loan Committee. Yes, sir. Okay. You want to continue this? Continue. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, next is the Environmental Advisory Commission. Council Member Meyerhofer. I've got one. I'd like to reappoint uh, Dr. Robert Shaw, please. Second. All right, motion's been made by Councilmember Meyerhofer, second by Councilmember Bell. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Nay. Motion. Congra <laughs> Congratu <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Dr. I. Shaw. I said aye. I. I meant to say aye. I. I didn't say it. Okay, six zero. Six Freudian zero. slip. Yeah. <laughs> Man. That's Whenever the mayor says say nay, that's what I do. I just... <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> next Moving board. Moving on, uh, next point is the Human Relations Council. Mayor Fortem Glover. Okay. I'd like to appoint Suzanne Camus and Talik Harris. Second. Second. Camus. Talik Harris, you said? Mm-hmm. Harris. Okay. All right, motion was made by Mayor Pro Tem Glover, second by Council Member Bell. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6 0. Congratulations, Ms. Camus. Congratulations, Mr. Harris. Okay, next board is the Police Community Relations Committee. Just a reminder this is a direct appointment, does not need a second or vote. Um, Council Member Smiley. We'll appoint Sterling Ruffin. Okay. Um, Council Member Daniels. Continue, please. Okay. And finally, we have the Youth Council. Mayor Pro Tem Glover. Okay. I'd like to um, reappoint um, Landon Gales. 
Second. All right. Motion's been made by Mayor Pro Tem Glover, second by Council Member Meyerhofer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6 0. Congratulations, Mr. Elks. And that concludes the appointments, Mayor Connolly. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to new business, which are the public hearings. The public hearing, this is the policy of the public hearings adopted by the City Council. The petitioner or representative of the petitioner and a leader of those in opposition will each have 10 minutes. Persons following them will have up to three minutes each with a total for each side no more than 30 minutes. Additionally, I want to remind those in attendance to extend the courtesy to persons speaking during the public hearing and to the City Council during discussion. Comments made by members of the public are to occur only during the public hearing as allowed by the Mayor in accordance with the adopted policy of the City Council. There should be no interruptions or, of speakers or council members, including expressions of support or disagreements, verbally or by applause, as this is distracting and makes discussion difficult. We ask you for your cooperation. Thank you. Madam Manager, our first public hearing of the night. Thank you, Mayor. The first public hearing of the, the night is to consider an ordinance to annex Lindale East Section 5, Phase 1, involving 16.94 acres located at the current termini of Rupert and Remington Drives. Chief Planner Shante Gooby will provide that presentation. Ms. Gooby? Good evening. Good evening. Mm -hmm. This property is located in the uh, southeastern quadrant of the city. It's more specifically located again uh, within the Lindale uh, subdivision at the uh, end of uh, Remington and then from the bottom this is Rupert Drive. The subject property is located in red. The green is already in the city limits. <clears throat> it's located in a preferred growth area on the tiered growth map. It'll be located in voting district number four. It's in the Fork Swamp Canal watershed, which requires 25 year detention. It is just uh, or almost 17 acres. It's anticipated to yield 34 single family lots with a estimated tax value of $17 million. And I will be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much. Any questions for Ms. Gooby? Just one quick question. Do you say it's District 4? It is. This, oh, okay. We yeah. changed the lines. Right. I'm glad you're paying attention, though. There's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of squirrels out there, even when you don't think I am. <laughs> All right, thank you. The public hearing is now open. Those who speak on behalf of the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. Seeing none, those in opposition to the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Open for a board discussion or a motion. Move to approve. Second. All right, motion has been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Meyerhofer. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6 0. All right, we'll move on to item number five, Madam Manager. <laughs> Thank you. Item number five is an ordinance requested by the Covington Group Limited to rezone 4.65 acres located between Turnberry and Smithwick, Smithwick Drives and east of the East Fire Tower Boulevard from General Commercial to Office Residential High Density Multifamily. Again, Ms. Gooby. <clears throat> Um, this property is located in the southeastern quadrant of the city. It's more specifically located between Turnberry Drive and Smithwick Drive. Uh, to the east is Charles Boulevard. To the west is Arlington Boulevard. Um, so it's between the uh, Food Line Shopping Center and then you have Wendy's and Parker's Barbecue on the other side. This property is just a bit over four and a half acres and uh, it's one of the few times we're actually dealing with a perfectly square piece of property. This is the existing land use. So everything that's shown in beige is vacant. Mm -hmm. Any properties in red are commercial. And then the properties across the street in blue, those are offices. Um, this property is located in the Fork Swamp Canal. So if um, stormwater is required, it would require 25 year detention. This property is uh, within the community activity focus area, which is at the intersection of Fire Tower and Charles Boulevard. Um, these activity centers are intended to serve about a three mile radius with goods and services. 
um, when you're comparing the full build out of the uh, existing zoning versus the proposed zoning, there's actually um, a uh, decrease in traffic. Property is currently zoned general commercial. Under the current zoning, the property would yield about 35,000 square feet of commercial space. So that could be retail, it could be restaurant. And then under the proposed zoning, the property could yield about 55 multifamily units. <clears throat> For the uh, future land use plan, um, this sort of this block, if you will, between Arlington and Charles, this sort of splits, not exactly down the middle. But the properties along Arlington are shown as mixed use. And within the Horizons Plan, mixed use is described as places to work, live, and shop. So the OR district, which is office and multifamily, is considered part of that character. Um, in staff's opinion, the request is in compliance with the Horizons Plan and the future land use plan map. Uh, staff recommends approval. And then at the March 15th PNZ meeting, um, the commission unanimous, unanimously uh, voted to recommend approval of the request, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Any questions for Ms. Kuby? Councilmember Smiley. What are the requirements for um, sidewalks on the on, thor on thoroughfares in and around this? Um, Sidewalks are, are considered are, are required on thoroughfares. However, this is not a thoroughfare, so a okay. sidewalk would not be required. Any other questions? But that runs with the roadway, not with the zoning, correct? That is correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you very much. The public hearing is now open. Those who speak on behalf of the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Scott Anderson, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the applicant to speak in favor of this request. Um, we agree with staff uh, that the proposed request is in conformance with the land use plan. Um, specifically, the office residential zoning that is being requested um, creates the mixed use pattern um, by providing an opportunity for a place to live in close proximity to places to work, shop, dine, um, receive medical care and other services all in a walkable pattern. Um, a lot of times I get up here and I get to talk about traffic and concerns with traffic. So uh, this case I'd like to point out in the staff report um, the agenda packet which states that the existing zoning can generate 6,181 daily trips and that the requested zoning can generate approximately 439 trips, which is a net decrease of 5,742 trips per day, which is over a 90% reduction in traffic. So not only by changing the zoning pattern um, do you get that decrease, but also by having a place where people can walk to all the goods and services um, that are needed and access to public transportation, which there's a bus stop right at this property. So. Um, all those things will have a, a cumulative effect in helping to reduce traffic in the thoroughfares around that property. Um, again, the request is consistent with the land use plan. Um, staff recommends approval. Planning and Zoning Commission voted unanimously to approve. Um, so we appreciate your support of this request and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions for Mr. Anderson? Just one. Council Member Smiley. You know, you, you, know you're, you and your client brought up walkability. Sure. Um, and so, and I've, People have talked, I have had some citizen feedback on this. They sure. didn't come tonight. And, uh, you know, they think it's a neat idea what you're doing there, but they, they focused on the walkability aspect sure. too. Sure. So any infrastructure that would support people actually walking to um, the surrounding um, things is probably, you know, that's the feedback I'm getting. They like the idea. They'd like to make sure that you guys are serious about that and that sure. it's reflected in what you build. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd love to tell you that, you know, it's a we're zoning, gonna go it's out a zoning and thing. And we're going to build sidewalks through no, our property. Um, and the attorney's going to tell you, you know, yeah. that I can't give you any promises on improvements that we'll make in the area. But, but we agree. We think sidewalks in this area are, are highly needed. Um, you know, I think this is a place where Arlington Boulevard in the past um, recent years extended sidewalk down. Um, and this would be an opportunity for the city to really evaluate and to look at in the future of places where um, sidewalks are needed. And, and we would love to see that occur and support that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Anderson? Thank you. 
Anyone else would like to speak on behalf of the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Seeing none, those in opposition to the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. All right, seeing none, close the public hearing. Open for a board discussion or a motion. Move to approve. Second. All right, motion has been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Meyerhofer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6 0. All right, well, thank you very much. We'll move on to item number six, Madam Manager. Thank you. Item number six is an ordinance requiring the demolition and removal of the dwelling located at 805 Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt Lane, which is known as Tax Parcel 22884. Les Everett with the Department of Planning and Development Services has the presentation. Mr. Everett. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Good evening. Uh, we're going to start off here uh, with the uh, tax parcel information and a uh, location on, on a map uh, of, the of the location, 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 okay. Um, let's go to the aerial view to give you a better idea of the uh, location of the property. All right, 805 Vanderbilt Lane uh, was involved in a structure fire approximately two years ago. Uh, no utilities have been active since. Uh, and just so you are aware, uh, enforcement uh, actions were delayed due to title slash ownership and uh, issues that we noticed along the way. So now we bring this to you and we share with you that the building value is $165. The land tax value is $4,950 with the total property tax of $5,115. You'll notice the estimate to repair is a little over 90,000 and in essence that is to rebuild to the minimum uh, given the extensive damage that you're about to see. Uh, estimated demolition cost is $6,500. So I'll share with you a few of the pictures. Staff recommends approval of the ordinance requiring the demolition and removal of the dwelling located at 885 Vanderbilt. And staff will be ready to begin after following the 90 day waiting period that's outlined in the ordinance. Any questions? Any questions for Mr. Everett? Nope. Thank you very much. Public hearing is now open. Those who speak on behalf of the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person is 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. Here in a second. <laughs> Seeing none, those in opposition to the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. Seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. Open for a board discussion or a motion. Move to approve. Second. All right, motion was made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Litchfield. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you very much. Thank you to the staff. I have uh, received many complaints about that house, and I know that the neighborhood will appreciate the demolition of that home, and I know that the uh, um, Habitat for Humanity will appreciate that as well since they have very well invested in that section of Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. All right, Madam Manager, item number seven. Thank you, Mayor. Um, item number seven is a resolution to close a 20-foot alley north of Dickinson Avenue, west of Moy Boulevard, and adjoining the southern right-of-way of the CLNA Railroad. Um, and City Engineer Lisa Kirby has the presentation. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Good evening. Uh, this is a private alley adjacent to the railroad near the intersection of Dickinson Avenue and Moy Boulevard. It was utilized to transport oil for multiple oil companies in the area. The approximate location of the alley is identified on the aerial photo by the red box. 
closure of this alley is being requested by the adjoining property owner, Carowan Oil Company. The street closure map shown here has been reviewed by city staff and Greenville Utilities Commission. GUC requests a 15-foot electrical easement parallel to the right-of-way of CLNA Railroad. It should be noted that the closure of this public access way will not impact access to the adjacent property owners. P&Z voted unanimously to recommend closure of the 20-foot alley at their March 15, 2022 meeting, reserving the 15-foot GUC electrical easement parallel to the right-of-way of CLNA Railroad. Staff also recommends closure, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Ms. Any questions for Ms. Kirby? Say no. Thank right. you very much. Mm -hmm. Public hearing is now open. Those who speak on behalf of the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. Seeing none, those in opposition to the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. Seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. Open for a board discussion or a motion. Move to approve. Second. All right, motion's been made by Council Member Bell, second by Council Member Litchfield. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6-0. All right, thank you very much. That was final public hearing. We'll move on to other items of the business. Item number eight, Madam Manager. Item eight is a resolution authorizing an application to the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources for the 22 historic pass-through grant to perform a National Register Architectural Survey and district nomination tentatively named East 5th Street Historic District. Uh, Tony Parker, who serves as a planner for our Depo Development Services Department, and um, will have the presentation. He also serves as a staff liaison to the Historic Preservation Commission. Mr. Parker. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and, and Council Members. Pleasure to be here this evening. Good evening. Good evening. This, we're going to, um, I'm going to present on agenda items number eight and number nine together to uh, reduce redundancy. Um, they're pretty much the same package. I'll just go through each piece separately. Um, Greenville currently has the opportunity to continue archiving its history by applying for two 2022 historic pass-through grants. Um, the grants originate with the National Park Service and are uh, administered by the State Historic Preservation Office, otherwise known as SHPO. So, the historic uh, pass-through grant will assist in, in funding the for, uh, nominations for the National Register of Historic Places. Um, currently, Greenville has um, five uh, uh, historic uh, districts. Um, the new one, the first grant, will be for the proposed East 5th Street District. Um, if you look at this map here, you'll see the five districts we have now, two of which are residential districts, one being um, the Skinnerville-Greenville Heights Historic District, and the other one is the College View Historic District. Um, the grant will be used to hire a consultant to perform an architectural survey and nomination for a National Register Historic District for the East 5th Street area, and that's shown on this map here. Um, it's approximately 60 acres and uh, approximately about 170 properties. The period of significance for this grant is from 1910 to 1972. Um, the properties have got to be at least 50 years old to be considered for this uh, uh, registration. Um, um, if it's not within the 50 year time frame, there has to be some kind of historical significance to bring it into that. Um, the grant will pro uh, be used to survey these properties on East 5th Street. It's important to understand that this is an honorary designation. Um, it is not a local designation. Um, the city nor the Historic Preservation Commission will have no purview on these properties. In other words, the owners of the properties can do whatever they would like with the properties. It's an honorary designation for the whole area. Um, and I think that that's the important piece right there. It's not a local designation. This is an honorary national designation. Um, not all properties will be um, surveyed will be included in the National Register. Um, listings of this can, can help build community pride um, and um, pride in their built environment. 
you can see that that's a college that that was East East Carolina Teachers College back in 1915 looking towards what is now College View and that empty field grew up through the last hundred years or so listing on the National Register does not mandate preservation of the property in the future in other words the property owners can sell it to another uh, investor or buyer and they do not have to maintain any kind of historical uh, significance they don't have to do any kind of preservation for the property again it is a honorary designation and not a local designation the benefits for the property owner is there's a 20 percent federal tax uh, investment credit that they can use uh, North Carolina has two credits as well um, if that if the North Carolina credits always depend upon state budget the total cost for this project is twenty five thousand dollars our grant request is for fifteen thousand dollars and our local matching funds which is forty percent of the grant would have to be ten thousand dollars and that is not budgeted currently our next steps is if you all approve this staff will submit the grant by the april 22nd deadline um, the grant awards will be uh, announced in june and the completion of the project should be done by september 2023 staff is requesting the authorized that city council authorize a motion for a submission of two applications to the 2022 historic preservation grant the other part of this is the college view historic district um, and you can see that that what we'll be doing there is a lot of the properties will be resurveyed that didn't make the cutoff last time there's other properties around the area that would be surveyed as well these would not be part of local designation this would be part of the national register which college view is already and therefore these houses and properties that are um, surveyed will have no um, no purview by the city historic preservation commission would have no pur purview people can do with their property as they will you can see this area here where the hash marks are is is the current uh, college who uh, college hill district and we'd like to survey the area that surrounds that it's important also to understand that that when East Carolina grew, so did that neighborhood and expanded that way. And the architectural significance, you can look at the area and see the smaller lots go to the bigger lots. You can see a lot of different history of these. The cost for this project is $30,000, but the grant request would be for $18,000. Local matching funds would be $12,000, 40% of the grant. And again, those funds are not currently budgeted. Um, and our deadline is the same as it was the first one. I'd be glad to answer any questions for you. Thank you, Ms. Parker. Councilmember Smiley. So, when was the uh, the current district? When when were the when was that survey done? It was done in the 1990s, early 1990s. So, 96, the, the houses actually. that didn't qualify at the time are now 30 could, years older. Yes, yes, and they could possibly get, qualify. Get now. more historic all the time. That's correct. And, th and th those houses now are con yeah. considered non-contributing to the neighborhood, so they they would be contributing and then just to make sure I understand if a house if you're listed on the National Register you are basically put on a list right and if you if you're on the list you're eligible for tax credits and things That's like correct. that if you the, the, the greatest penalty that you could suffer for doing anything would be that you'd be taken off the list right I mean there's no requirement to stay on the list and if you that's correct you know put aluminum all over your house or whatever the whatever the rule whatever the National National Park Service thinks isn't correct they could take you off the list, but there's no, there's nothing there's, there's bind, no there's downside. No binding no, out there's, action. There's no downside to this. Okay. This, this, this helps um, improve property values. Um, it really, it helps us keep the history of Greenville alive by recording who built these houses, who lived in these houses, what professors, chancellors, et cetera, walk through those neighborhoods and streets, what students were there. Um, it, it's really to help tell the story, to improve property values, and also to give these property owners the possibility of applying for tax credits. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Parker? Move to approve both items. Second. All right. Motion was made by Councilmember Smiley, second by Councilmember Daniels. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6 0. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Parker. Thank you. Appreciate the, uh, the quick uh, presentations and combining both of those. <laughs> We'll move on to item number 10. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 10 is the fiscal 22 third quarter general fund financial update. 
and a preview of the City of Greenville's FY 22-23 proposed budget. Director of Financial Services, Byron Hayes, has the presentation. Byron. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Uh, we will uh, have a brief uh, presentation um, of the proposed budget draft of 2023 and a brief presentation of the 2022 uh, third quarter financial update. Uh, just to remind uh, council and everyone watching the city's uh, mission statement to provide citizens with uh, high quality services. And uh, for the 2023 budget goals this year, uh, we have six budget goals. Uh, be a high performing city, uh, create a great workforce, a strong community, a safe community, build sound infrastructure, and provide a vibrant place to live, work, and play. Um, and the current budget, uh, or, or the future budget, will maintain council direction uh, on our progress, or uh, yes, progress of capital projects, uh, such as Wildwood, Epps, and the community pool, uh, an emphasis on the pavement management program, uh, continuing our stormwater utility plan that was approved in 2019, uh, investment in city staff, uh, an emphasis in traffic services initiatives, uh, a commitment to support economic development in the community, and a commitment to arts, entertainment, and special events. Um, in terms of budget highlights, uh, this, the budget will maintain the current tax rate at 48.95 cents. Uh, it will provide $4 million for both the pavement or for the pavement management uh, program as well as other infrastructure improvements. Um, providing a 4% merit to market increase for employees as well as a million dollars in the compensation study uh, based on market data. Um, it includes funding for six additional fire rescue positions, uh, at three of which will be for Station 7 staffing and three will be reclassifications for the tiller truck operation, um, as well as six uh, new positions for increased infrastructure maintenance throughout the city. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it does uh, continue the stormwater plan, the second year of that stormwater plan that was approved in 2019. Uh, the budget will be uh, $95.16 million. Uh, and as you can see, it's balanced revenues and expenses. And uh, in terms of revenues, uh, 75 million of the 95 million uh, is made up of property sales and utilities taxes. That's the largest share. Uh, just a breakdown of how that comes out, about 82% um, is made up of those property, uh, sales tax, utilities, franchise tax, and the GC transfer. Um, comparing uh, the budget to the current budget, it's about a 6% increase. And uh, uh, look at property taxes, as you guys can see, um, there has been a steady decline over the past 20 years in our property tax rate. Uh, it's currently the lowest that it's been in those 20 years at 48.95 cents. Hey, can you go back one more slide? Yes. One okay. more. One more. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was saying, even with the property tax uh, consistently decreasing, we do see a rise in property tax revenues. Uh, property tax revenues have uh, risen at an average growth rate over the past three years, about three and a half percent. And we currently have uh, just under three percent for a growth rate in 2023. Uh, additionally, sales tax has also increased during that time, uh, much more significantly than uh, property tax. Uh, the three year average has been just under 10 percent. Uh, however, we are keeping that property or the sales tax rate flat for the current year, uh, just as a conservative measure um, due to the, the level of volatility that's taking place. Um, in terms of expenses, uh, still $95.16 million uh, for the general fund expenses. About 63% of that is made up of personnel. And um, comparing the expense budget to last year's budget as well, a 6% increase. I'll give you all a second to take a look at that as well. Uh, moving on to the personnel expenses within the general fund. Um, the general fund expenses uh, for personnel do include a 4% employee wage increase, a million dollars for those potential salary uh, increases that would be uh, derived from the compensation study, uh, as well as 1.2 increase in the employer share of the retirement contribution for employees. Um, and the budget does include a 4% vacancy rate for personnel. Um, it also includes those three new fire rescue officers for Station 7 and uh, three captain reclassifications for that tiller truck operation, as well as an additional uh, ma uh, uh, police officer rank in the police department of a master police officer, and uh, the six new positions for the increased infrastructure maintenance needs throughout the city. Um, breaking down the personnel expenses, 68% uh, of those expenses are salary and 32% uh, are benefits. 
and uh, taking a look at operating and our capital expenses, about $22 million um, of the general fund budget is operating expenses. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty evenly distributed with our um, largest uh, categories being contracted services and our fleet charges. Uh, breaking down our capital expense, it's about $1.5 million, uh, about 1.6% of the overall budget. The majority of this is made up of our uh, larger vehicles that um, are paid for out of the ve uh, vehicle replacement fund. Uh, the vehicles that cost over $35,000. Um, taking a look at transfers, the, the city is um, proposing uh, $13.7 million worth of transfers in the current, in uh, the, the new fiscal year. And in summary, um, the, this, this budget does uh, continue an investment in our capital operations and personnel of the city and does maintain the current tax rate at 48.95 cents. And next steps, uh, we will have a, a proposed budget presentation on April 25th, um, a public hearing May 12th, and the budget adoption on May 23rd. I uh, do want to remind the council that the results of the market wage study will not be ready by the time that uh, the budget is um, approved by you all, uh, but this, uh, the study, should we should have those results in the fall of 2020, um, uh, excuse me, the fall of 2022. 23 or 20? 23. 2022, 20, 22. Okay, the slide the says 23. I'm yeah, just, sorry okay. about that. The fall of 2022, okay. fiscal year 2023. Um, so before we move on to the uh, third quarter update, does anyone have any questions? What was the calculation for, what was the rental rate in the, for funding the um, vehicle vehicle replacement fund? Uh, it's at 50% it's at for vehicles over $35,000 okay. this year. And 100% for any vehicles under $35,000. Any other questions? All right, so we will move on to the third quarter financial update for the current fiscal year. Um, just a brief um, explanation of the assumptions that we use for the, the projections for the current fiscal year. Uh, those projections are based on the previous five years of revenue and expense data. Um, there is consideration given for any changes in service and spending uh, due to COVID-19, um, as well as uh, we did try and remove any large outlying data from one-time spending in order to maintain consistency in, that, um, in the budget projections. Um, there is no non-essential spending after um, May 15th due to our purchasing cutoff, um, so that is also factored into those projections as well. And we do continue to make 100% uh, of our budgeted transfers each year, so that is also factored in. Um, the, uh, Summary of this is uh, the revenues uh, came in at about $93.5 million. Expenses came in at right around 90, so that's a net of uh, roughly $3.5 million revenues over expenses. Um, in terms of revenue, uh, as you can see, about revenues ended up about, or are projected to be about 300,000 more than the revised budget for the current fiscal year. Um, the majority of the uh, large increase ends up being uh, in sales tax. We do see some of the main factors of that sales tax increase for the current fiscal year is due to the shift in spending behavior uh, of, of the community, as well as increased costs and the fact that uh, the effects of COVID for the uh, organization were less than we originally anticipated. Um, additionally, we also did see a large increase in um, the amount of revenue we brought in uh, for the rescue transport service. Um, this is due to the increased uh, billing volume uh, that we will that we currently see and will see in the future. Um, however, all the revenues were not all great. We did uh, see a, a pretty a pretty significant decrease in our investment earnings for the current fiscal year, which is due to the um, uh, lower interest rates as well as just a negative market performance that we currently have. Um, and then breaking that down. Um, uh, the $93.5 million, the two largest sections uh, are property tax and our sales tax, which make up about 69% of our total revenues. Um, and then looking at expenses, um, expenses ended up being about, or are projected to be about $3 million less than our revised budget. Um, some of the areas uh, that we see that, that um, play into that $3 million under budget number is our police department at about $2 million under budget, which is mainly due to staffing shortages, uh, which cause decreased personnel costs. Um, our recreation and parks department, which has uh, uh, several changes in programming uh, at the beginning of the year due to COVID-19, uh, which did reduce expenses in addition to those um, uh, changes in the programming. 
Um, and also in our information technology department, uh, there were significant supply chain issues that we saw during the year, which delayed the delivery of our computer hardware. Um, but staff will continue to monitor uh, each department budget to ensure that no department goes over at the end of the year. Um, and then breaking that down, about 47% of our total um, $90 million projected budget is in public safety. So in summary, uh, $93.5 million in revenue uh, projected and $90 million of expenses projected for a net of $3.5 million. Uh, factoring in next year's uh, a a fund balance appropriation of 150000 as well as our anticipated encumbrance carryover of about $1.75 million. Uh, that leaves us with about $1.5 million. Um, and our current year capital needs, uh, we have about $1.2 million in current year capital needs. Uh, these are things that, as you recall, um, were originally in our um, uh, capital improvement plan. Uh, however, we did know that, or, or we did anticipate being able to fund some of those projects in the current fiscal year. And so we are providing that list here for you tonight uh, with the anticipation that we will submit um, these, this list of projects for appropriation in a May budget amendment. Um, and just some other factors to consider for quarter four and the end of the year. Um, obviously, uh, there are inflationary concerns for the cost and goods of services for the city. And we are uh, continuing to monitor the price of fuel. Um, fuel's been very volatile recently. And so um, uh, while we're anticipating that uh, to go down some um, in the future, we are still monitoring that in order to make sure that we um, still come in under budget with, with the rest of our uh, departments. Um, additionally, we do have changes in the year in receivables. Um, an increased sales tax number does end up with a larger receivable at the end of the year. So we are factoring that in when we're considering our projection and our end of year performance. Um, however, a decreased uh, rescue receivable does happen with the timing of our billing coming in. Um, and then as always, as I mentioned before, uh, any supply chain issues that we have and that we've seen currently in this year um, are resulting in increased encumbrances, which is why our encumbrance number has gone up a little bit um, a, that we're anticipating for the end of the year. Um, any questions about the uh, financial update? Council Member Smiley. So with the substantial underruns in, uh, on the personnel side, mm -hmm. is 4% vacancy, the 4% vacancy rate for next year's budget is that the right number? I mean, should that number be, you know, higher and, you know, maybe have, you know, and if you're especially if you're expecting, you know, potentially overruns or inflationary increases in fuel or something like that, um, you know, would it would be better to budget that money into, I don't know, you know, you know, additional road expenditures or, or fleet or something like that. If, if you're seeing, you know, $2 million is a big number mm -hmm. on a 50, $60 million um, uh, payroll number. So, yeah. Council Member Smiley, at this point, 4% uh, is what we have historically always done for the budget. Um, while in some places we are running um, ahead of that with some vacancies, there are some other departments where we are not. We are also getting ready, would anticipate both uh, 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 a range adjustment as well as changes in compensation due to the pay plan study that's underway. And, um, and we don't really know what the future holds. And so our belief is that 4% is the right number to start the budget with. If we do, um, we'll continue to always monitor the budget through the fiscal year. And if the point at which we believe that um, there's additional money to allocate, we could bring it back to you all for the council to allocate in other capital projects, which is what typically what our project, what our um, process has been. That's fine. I, I mean, I would defer to staff on this, except, and I know that the 4% number is an arbitrary number. It got made up, and I know because I made it up. Um, you know, six or seven, that. you know, several years ago, we were allocating 100% of the budget, I mean, of salaries, and so we, well, we should put a vacancy number in there, and we made up a 4% number. Um, at some point, you know, custom and usage is fine, but I, that really should be based on data, right? You should be, you know, should be driven by, you know, this is what it's been for the last three or four years or five years or whatever the right number is. But um, especially if we're seeing, you know, $2 million of, of $60 million payroll is 4%, something like that. So um, anyway, that's just my only concern. I think it's, there's nothing, I don't mind, I don't mind that we're doing stuff because we've always done it that way to some extent, except that in this particular case, we really didn't have a good reason to do it to begin with. It was, you know, it was a political compromise on council rather than a calculation by a financial professional. 
Kevin, and, and I, I think from our staff, we've actually had some interesting discussion about what that vacancy rate would be, what we should do with the budget, and we believe that for, we want to create a budget that we can um, adhere to, and we, while there, we are in an incredibly unusual times, we don't know what the future holds, and we believe that a 4% rate best serves us We'll continue, again, we'll continue to monitor it, and we're happy to come back to the council with, uh, with updates, and if there it looks like there's additional dollars to reallocate the capital projects, we'll bring it back to you. Okay. All right, any other questions? Thank you for the very quick uh, presentation. No we look forward to seeing you again on the 25th. I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the city manager's report. Mayor, I have no report this evening. All right, we'll move on to comments by the mayor and the city council. Let's start this way. How about council member Daniels? Okay. Threw you off, didn't I? If you like, I can come back. No, 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 I'm fine. Um, a couple of things. First, I would like to thank, thank Chief Holtzman and Detective Robert Signs on the team dating. Um, program that they did last night. It was very informative. I hope it was recorded. I'm not sure if it was. Um, I think that is something that's very important for parents and everyone that should yeah. know. Um, um, Detective Science did an excellent job and I truly appreciate that. Also Saturday we are having a spring egg scravaganza um, with recreation and parks. Let me see that will be held in Greenfield Terrace from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. The rain date is April the 23rd. And last night, I got to dance at the Joy Soup Kitchen with the Steppers. Um, I hope that was recorded but, too. Uh, <laughs> no, that wasn't recorded. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was the New Look Steppers. Um, I'm telling you, Joy Soup Kitchen is doing a lot of wonderful things in our community at this time. Mm -hmm. And also, the ECU Smile Squad Honor Society was there. They are a new service-oriented student organization that consists of pre-dental students on ECU's campus. And they did a wonderful job teaching children about te um, teeth health. Um, is that them? Um, <laughs> and also, um, they provided the students with toothbrushes and things like that um, to brush their teeth. And last but not least, we have started Zumba in the park again. So everybody come on out, get your Zumba on, and let's have some fun. Thank you. All right. Councilmember Bell. I don't have much. I would just like to say we're a month away from municipal elections, and uh, there will be some new faces inevitably uh, from that election. We've got a couple council members up here that are not seeking re-election. Um, so I would just like to, you know, while we have time, express my appreciation for everybody up here. Uh, we, I feel like we've all done a great job of being able to work together at a time in you know, the world and nation where things have been you know, extremely politically divisive. I've really appreciated the team effort that we've all had, so thank you all. I think there's a couple of people that are vying for a uh, really strong write-in campaign. <laughs> <laughs> what if you guys won with a write-in campaign? <laughs> if, elected, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve, I think is what he's saying. <laughs> Councilmember Smiley. I have no comments. Councilmember Litchfield. No comments. Councilmember Meyerhofer. I'm all set, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem Glover. Well, I guess I did all my comments on Monday night. So everybody have a safe weekend. Um, it is budget time, so... Um, there are lots of things um, we did discuss. I know that we'll have a joint GUC meeting coming up 25th. on the 25th uh, with City Council. And um, I was just surprised that, that um, they're having problems hiring people with CDL license. And, and so uh, um, Ms. Waller and I were at the um, Greenville Shelter yesterday, and um, we did talk about um, to the shelter people that um, they need to contact Ernest Lee at Pitt Community College because he has a CDL program so um, we can get people going. And also for employees who like to get their CDL 
um, also that program is available to them as well. So I would uh, advise anyone if you uh, want to uh, have your CDL so you can get you know get another job or a better job whichever you see it um, please contact Mr. Ernest Lee at Pitt Community College um, there's a lot of programs going on out there and uh, he will be glad to um, talk to you about all of those programs thank you all right thank you very much I've got a special one tonight about, well, exactly six years ago today, I was sitting where council member Daniels is sitting right now, and I got a text message from my wife to let me know that her water had just broke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I told council member Smiley, I was like, hey, I gotta leave in a second. And he went in full panic mode. You gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta go over and over. And I was like, <laughs> it's okay. This is our second child. The baby's not coming right away. It'll take a little bit of time. And sure enough, I excused myself from the meeting. I got up and I left and I went over to the hospital. And several hours later, in a suit, I was holding my newborn daughter. Mm -hmm. And today, Caroline, my youngest, turned six years old. So I wanted to wish her a happy birthday today. Um, she's super excited and uh, had a great birthday party last weekend out at Stokes Farm. Anytime you can go out there and let them play with a bunch of farm animals, it's always a good time. So, yep. And here I am at city council and she's waiting for me to stop talking so I can come back and celebrate with her. So I just want to wish everybody a happy Easter. I hope everybody has a great uh, Easter weekend. Uh, be able to celebrate with your friends and family and be able to get a little bit of time off. I know the city's closed tomorrow. So hopefully all of our city employees will be able to get a little bit of rest and relaxation and get back to work on Monday. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Attorney McGirt to take us into closed session. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Mayor and Council have a rather lengthy uh, closed session motion, so I ask for your patience. Um, I recommend the Council adopt the following motion holding a closed session for the following reasons. Pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318.11, to discuss matters relating to the location or expansion of industries or other businesses in the area served by the public body, including agreement on a tentative list of economic development incentives that may be offered by the public body in negotiations, and pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318.11A3, uh, to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body, including consultation relating, relating to the following lawsuits entitled Eric Stephen Farrington, Craig D. Mamros, Plaintiffs versus City of Greenville, Pitt County Board of Ed Education, Defendants, Mary Sue Vitavis, Plaintiff versus City of Greenville, Pitt County Board of Education, Phil Berger in his capacity as President Pro Tempore of the Senate, and Tim Moore in his capacity as Speaker of the House of Representatives Defendants. Uh, third lawsuit, Chase Jean Matthews, Jackie Olson, Alexander Pascal, Tiffany, Tiffany Shaw, Mark Owens Jr., Barbara Owens, Matthew Allen, and Jessica Lubender, individually and on behalf of all other uh, similarly situated plaintiffs versus City of Greenville, Phil Berger in his capacity as President Pro Tempore of the Senate, and Tim Moore in his capacity as Speaker of the House of Representatives and, and Defendants. Last case, Sean Rambert Sr., co-administrator of the estate of Sean Michael Rambert Jr. and Danielle Cox Rambert, co-administrator of the estate of Sean Michael Rambert Jr. Plaintiffs versus City of Greenville and David Brandon Johnson in his individual and official capacities defendants. That is the suggested motion. We need to go into closed session. All right, motion's been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Daniels. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6-0. We are officially in closed session. <laughs>